you can't get to a level of self-hatred if you are if you are consistently loved by people Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Virtue Signal. I'm Bill Whittle with my friend and associate, Alfonso Rachel, and uh, you probably pretty much know the drill by now. Uh, so the election is over and all of that kind of mechanical, you know, real world stuff is uh, set aside for another year anyway. Like, really, it's all done? It's wrapped up now? Is it- no, we, no, no, we don't okay. know the answer. We won't know the answer until next election. I'm just saying we might as well just, you know, <laughs> pitch a tent and, you know, open the beans and sit back and enjoy the sunset. Uh but what I thought maybe would be a fun thing for me to do just as a series for me, I know you have your own topics, obviously, mm. uh, is when I look around, I, I realize that one of the main objectives of uh, of the left is to make sure that uh, nobody knows anything, but, but not just about important things like math or science. Nobody knows anything about uh, morality, about what's, you know, what's important. They, they, the, all the, the only thing they know that's important are the things that they're told that's important based upon this um, so-called philosophy of theirs. So I thought maybe we could do a series, sort of an ongoing series on what matters, just sort of as a, just like imagining like a, like a clean sheet of paper. It's not that, not that I want us to imagine that we don't have values, but if we had to put together a message like a time capsule or something and explain uh, to people who never had any basis in anything. They've never never been taught religion, civics. They've never been taught American history, never been taught ethics, philosophy, none of it. It's kind of a what do we believe things and why. So actually, I kind of think maybe what I want to do is, is just for, I don't know how many episodes this will run until we get out of topics, I guess. <laughs> but what I'd like to do a series of things. Basically, I think the short form would be what is important, what what matters. And I think the first thing for that one would would probably be this. When I when I think about the things in the world, practical things, right? I want to I want to list a series of practical things, and then kind of get to why these practical things are so important. When I was thinking about things that are important in the real world, again, I want to work from the practical to the to the moral, not the other way around. When I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, the most important thing in the world to me is family. It's not the most um, visible thing in the world to me. It's certainly not the thing that's closest in front of my face most of the time anyway, but it is the most important thing to me. Uh, Whenever I think about uh, the the real world going south, my first thoughts are always, how can I take care of my family? Now, it doesn't just have to be your biological family. There are people who are close enough to you to consider as family Certainly, you marry into uh, a family. But when I think about it, I realize that all of my primary concerns in terms of what what out there would cause me to make the most dramatic changes if, if necessity were to require them, I realize it's not even... I would do things for my family that I wouldn't do for my own self. I would put... I would go through... I would go through hardships for myself that I wouldn't... that I wouldn't want to put my family through. And so maybe that'd be a good place to start. Um, I have a relatively large family. I, I don't think yours is, is quite as big, but certainly you appreciate the value of this. And certainly the entire idea of family is something that is next on the list of things to be destroyed. The entire reason that, that parents and families are so upset is because um, these activists are openly, and I mean, when I say openly, I mean, there's a video of, of, I don't know, 30, 40 people in a panel, all of these progressive teachers singing in unison, yes, we're going to take your children away from you. <laughs> yes, we are. Um, and and the, the idea of this traditional family is not just important to us, it's important to uh, the people that want to end freedom because they understand that ultimately the family is the is the one nut that they have to crack. And, and if you look at totalitarian societies, that's very clear. The first thing that they try to do is indoctrinate the kids. And if they can indoctrinate the kids well enough to turn their parents in, then they're well on their way. So what do you think about that? Do you think there's something more important than family in life? Or do you think that's a, a good place to start? Um, I guess in terms of um, you know something that would, people would view as tangible or uh, 
you know, um, you know, practical, if you will. Yeah, it'd be a good place to start. Uh, I myself, I wouldn't start there. Um, okay. and, and I'll tell you why. Um, like, say, for instance, liberals, you know, your Democrat voter, man, they're using the whole family dynamic to destroy the family. Uh, and I, that could be demonstrated. And we talked about this before, man. We talked about it and how, um, you know, Democrats, how amazingly they're able to use the free market. They hate the free market, but they use the free market. They hate, you know, uh, uh, um, our advent of technology and how it's how it's um, being used to facilitate capitalism and stuff like that as they sit at Starbucks with their iPhones and stuff like that. You know, communicating warped ideas and selling warped ideas. They, they use these very things to destroy the things that they claim to hate. So even as far as family goes, um, I wouldn't start with family because the thing is, even even Jesus himself, just like you, you mentioned before, uh, you, alluded, you alluded to your family doesn't necessarily have to be your blood, per se. And Yeshua himself made that quite clear. They said, hey, Jesus, man, your mom and your and your brothers and stuff, man, they're looking for you. And Jesus said, hey, my mama and my brothers are right here. Mm. Right. These people who are on my frequency, my family thinks I'm crazy. Right. And, and they did. Right. It says so. they thought he was nuts. So then finally they came around and they realized who, he, who he's always said he's been. The thing with family is that there's a push and it's always been that your family is paramount over everything. Now, the Lord himself says, look, when it comes to your wife, you are to love her sacrificially. You are to give yourself to your wife the same way that I'm going to give myself for the church. That's that's that sacrificial love that you're talking about. Right. That is a directive of man. So but the thing is, a lot of times because we get caught up with family loyalty and the things that we're supposed to sacrifice uh, for our family, a lot of times people end up sacrificing the wrong things. And when you put when when a when a family puts their family before God himself, what you end up with is the idolization of your family. And we see it all the time, people trying to keep the family together and they'll go down the road doing things that will contribute to the decline of society, trying to de demonstrate loyalty to their family, to try to keep maybe the affections of their son or daughter. They got to go along with what their kids learned in college. Right. And they're learning in college that, well, there's more than one gender and, and collectivist ideas and these ideas about the planet. And in order to keep these this relationship with their kids, they're sacrificing actual virtue to maintain a relationship with their kids. You know, and that's all caught up with pride, insecurities and all those sorts of things. That's why with a family, it's like, look, as this, as the word says, as for me in my house, we shall serve the Lord this way. If we have that as a basis, it keeps us from thinking that to be loyal to each other, we got to go sideways, but we just have to accept it because, well, we're family. Well, fair enough. But if you're going to if you're going to place um, uh, scripture ahead of family, mm. you still have to face the fact that you don't know how to read until you're four or five. <laughs> and you don't know how to read that kind of stuff until you're, I would say, well into your teens, at least in terms of comprehending it. Uh -huh. I mean, whether you like it or not, the the. The religion you are, the religion that you are, the family you are born into determines the religion that you have. Unfortunately, and and as you get older, you are able to decide to make a choice and so on. But but what I'm trying to say here is, is that before you can read the Bible, before you can understand words, forget, forget even reading. Mm -hmm. Okay, before any of the stories that 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 are in the Bible or the Quran or the or the or the Talmud or any of this stuff, before any of this stuff can happen, mm -hmm. your formative the, the, the most important formative elements of your life are going to be determined by your family. They're going to be determined by your family from birth and that all of the philosophical stuff that later determines who you become and who you are, mm -hmm. are, are a result or, or at the very least are downstream of that. And when you talk about the loss of, of religion and morality, I couldn't agree with you more, but the, but the reason the reason, and I'm talking about America now as, an ex as a specific example, the reason that that religion and and morality and godliness are, have are, are evaporating out of life is because of the destruction of the family. Mm -hmm. it, that was what preserved the transmission of these values throughout 250 years of our history, and starting with the birth control pill, and then with liberalizing ab abortion laws, and then the welfare state, and all the rest of it. What you end up with is you end up with with children that are born into a state of um, chaos. 
not just not just uh, economic chaos or or even the kind of chaos that comes with you know open doors and mom's got nine boyfriends or all the rest of it, but 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 philosophical chaos. <laughs> without the without the foundation of the family, there's no um, you don't have the luxury of talking about these things. And this is why I think it's so important because all of the all of the values that that make up what made this country great and can, and and still makes it great for for at least half of the country is a, is a recognition that 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 the values that that make us who we are not just the values either it's 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 even deeper than values it's it's simple things like are children being hugged enough you know are they are, are the is the environment that a child born into is that an environment of security where whatever arguments the parents might have, they keep in private and quiet and not in front of the kids? Or are they or are they born into a world where there's constant yelling and screaming and fighting and cursing and, you know, mom says your dad is this and dad says your mom is that? And I don't see how you can develop any kind of a, of a solid religious basis if your life is in such a state of perpetual turmoil and anguish by... So that you never get, by the time you're able to, comp forget again, forget about reading the Bible, before you're able to comprehend sentences in terms of what they mean. And these are some fairly complex ideas, the ideas, mm -hmm. any religious ideas. By the time you get to that point, you've either got a loving environment and a protecting environment or you don't. And whether you do or don't is going to make a large determinant on whether or not you are able to accept those messages and and internalize them or whether you're going to just assume that the world is a chaotic and evil and and unpredictable and unsafe place that is ruled by nothing but chance and circumstance and and random acts of 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 cruelty and and that's why i think it's the most important thing i don't think you can i, I consider it to be the garden in which any particular seed of of religious belief or morality or anything else is sown, and if you're and if the garden is is you know if, if the soil is barren and there's no water, you you can put as many wonderful ideas on top of that as you want to. They're not gonna they're not going to take root. Man, there's uh you're you're, you're hitting on some on some important points, man. Uh, I agree with you in terms of when you're talking about family. That's why it's in the commandment: honor your father and your mother. Right. So that has to be there. But even before that, and I, I know what you're saying, that you got to be able to read it. The Lord already addresses this. The word already tells us that sin went out into the world before the law did. All right. So these things, what we read in Scripture, this wasn't even codified until Moses came along. But, but God gave the account of everything that happened before Moses came along. So we didn't have a written law. But the, the, the thing about the law is that as human beings made in the image of God, God, and when you say God, when you talk about the word of God, the logos, the reason, the law, the instruction, that's what we're talking about. We are beings that are supposed to be able to register these things. We're supposed to have a logical output. We're supposed to be distinguished from animals in that we're, that we're supposed to be able to recognize these things, have a sense of empathy, if you will. So really what it comes down to that there's no excuse. The word of God tells us not to just to be able to, you know, when we're talking about being disciples and making disciples of nations, the word of God says to minister to all creation. That means you're ministering to things that can't even read, right? My cat can't read, but you know what? I'm supposed to minister to my cat. Now, my cat can't understand what I'm saying, but in the way that I treat my cat, making sure that my cat is fed, watered, you know, has a, has a you know, safe place to live, gets to the vet and stuff like that. You are supposed to be kind to your creatures and all that sort of stuff. The place where you live, you are supposed to demonstrate that you have a sense of gratitude about where you are. I don't have to write that down. I don't got to say nothing to nobody. That's in my actions. So all these things are supposed to be demonstrated. And even if we don't have a doctrine, the bottom line is, is that people on their own accord will make one. And that's already that's already been addressed in scripture. When you know people be trying to say, where well, there was religions before there was Christianity, and God's like, duh, I never hid that from you. I told you that there was cultures and there was all kinds of religions before I showed up as Jesus Christ. That all itself is hard. People are gonna do it on their own accord, and that's a problem. So, you know, the Lord Himself is, yeah, he there's there's not this premium per se that he puts on family 
the thing that is going to hold your family up and the foundation that your family needs to be built on in the first place is the Lord. As, as he says, look, do not provoke your children to wrath. Raise your kids up in the instruction of the Lord. And right now, we're as you mentioned, we get further and further away from these things and we're starting to get pretty bent out of shape with each other. And the Lord is definitely getting bent out of shape with us. And the Lord says, look, don't assume that I have come to bring peace. I've come to bring the sword and I will take this sword and I will drive it between fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, your friends, your aunts, anybody, anybody who tries to cut you off from me and lead you in another direction and interrupts your shalom and interrupts true joy and tries to drag you into hell with them with their warped ideas. I don't care if they are your blood family. I will drive a sword between you. But you've just said, you know, um, basically respect your your, your mm -hmm. parents and, yeah. and you've also just said instruct your children essentially in the ways of of the lord the idea that the children could just get this without a family i just don't think makes any sense right. there are there are many cases of feral children oh, wait how did i say this is without a family i'm talking about the the order of it the premium of it you got to have something to build that family on. i'm not saying but, that the family's not important but the family the family is the the family is the conduit for for ethics you you get your ethics from your parents who got their ethics from their parents who got their ethics from their parents that's how that's how it works biologically there are not large numbers but there are certainly numbers of feral children who've been either locked up in a in a in a, in a room someplace or literally raised by wolves that kind of thing and they don't even have language they they don't have they, they don't have the ability to communicate and it's not just their inability to communicate. Their their actual thinking is limited by the fact that that they grew up in a situation where they had to be feral, had to concentrate on on survival. Mm -hmm. The entire point of why I'm saying the family, I think, is is the first thing. Look, in in, in Genesis, right? You've got you've got God says, "Don't eat of this of this tree," okay? And Eve does, and Adam could have said. Do what you want to the girl. Just leave me alone, <laughs> right? But but he didn't, mm. right? He 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 was constructed in such a way that he took the walk out the gate for something he personally didn't do, mm. because his family was more important to him than that, and that was something that was put into him. Mm -hmm. That's how he was built, and and this destruction of the family is to me the single great. Um initiator mm. of of all of our social ills the, the obviously a, a, it's well known fact that when you look at the number of people who are in prison the one thing that they have in common it's not if you take a, a, a an inmate population which is almost exclusively male you're going to find that it's not that they have the same class in common the same income in common it's not the same that they have the same region in common the one thing that the vast majority especially of violent criminals have in common is they didn't have any fathers they didn't have right. a father figure it doesn't have to be your biological father right. but it does have to be a father figure it has to be somebody who you regard as family somebody who you respect beyond beyond the respect you would give to virtually anyone and i'll even go far enough to say because i've seen this before and I don't think this is a surprise for some people, that that there are disturbed young men who are disturbed their entire lives. And let's say they get drafted or they enlist in the Marine Corps. Now, all of a sudden, the Marine Corps is their family. And that drill, that, that drill instructor is now the father that they never had. Mm -hmm. and, and in many cases, it completely turns their lives around. So on some level, all of this, all of all of this, I don't want to dismiss it, obviously, it's sure. the most important thing, but but all of the theoretical has to have a receptacle into which it can be placed. And mm -hmm. if that receptacle is not built in such a way, then it's virtually impossible, not completely, but virtually impossible for that message to get through. And when you talk about um, Jesus saying, my family is right here in this room, that's that's the family that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm not yes. necessarily talking about your biological family, right. but basically what he's saying is, is that the people who I consider to be family, not just associates, not just people I preach to, not just even admirers, right? This group, these 12 disciples, mm -hmm. and, and Mary Magdalene and a few others, right? Mm -hmm. These are the people who matter more to me than I do. And you're right that religion uh, obviously existed before Christianity, but if you look at if you look at the religions that existed before Christianity, what you find are families 
They're very, very different in structure. Yeah, I mean, if if you if you just want to go back to to Babylon and, and Baal, mm. you've got a you've got a situation where rich and powerful men have large numbers of wives, mm. right? And and their children, their and their children are all their male children are are their property is allocated according to a system where the where the oldest male usually gets most of everything, and all of the society that that boils out of that is based on the family structure, and it's only when you get to Christianity. And this idea of Adam and Eve, when you get to Adam and Eve, you get to the idea of, of two different equal parts that have to combine mm. in order to create the next generation. And that social structure that is built out of that religious structure provides a level of success that has never been seen before in the world. And I don't mean just material success. Mm -hmm. I mean I mean spiritual happiness. Yeah. When I think about when I think about how, look we live in a in a we live in an imperfect world and it will always be an imperfect world. And I don't have to tell you that. But when I think about human happiness the 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 place my mind always goes to visualize this is rural American life for most of of the existence of this country. Right? The, the happiest people that I personally know are the ones that have the strongest family ties. And in many cases, uh, I know this is going to open up a, a lot. This is my personal experience, okay? I'm not saying this is the truth. I'm just saying this is my personal experience because I live here with the vampires, right? I mean, I, I'm not a – I don't live in, in America. I live – I live in Mordor. But as a person who lives in Mordor or and occasionally tours um, Gondor, um, it's been my experience that the, the happiest kids that I found, not the only happy kids I found, but as a percentage, were actually kids of, of Mormon families who, who go at life with this extremely self-contained look. I went to do a first speaking event I ever did was it uh, was in Utah. The two speaking events in Utah and I got shown around um, Salt Lake City by students from Brigham Young and Brigham Young was not one of the universities that I spoke at. But uh, they're driving me around town and they're pointing out the one liquor store in the entire city, right? As a like a tourist novelty. Oh, look at that. And and I, I went to college. I said, so what do you guys do? And they said, well, a lot of times we mostly, you know, we do dances. We go out for dances sometimes at nighttime outside and stuff. I said, wow, okay. But, I mean, how do you spend most of your time? I said, well, I spend all, almost all of my time with my family. My, they're my favorite people in the world. I'm going to be with them forever. And, and I was just so blown away by that. And then, and now the point is, not, not only did they say that, but they struck me as astonishingly happy people who had already, at age 20, had hundred thousand dollars in savings, six months of food in the in the in the basement. Spent two years of missionary service in the Philippines, or whatever the case may be. I'm not saying that's restricted to Mormons at all. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is those are the only, those are the majority of what I would consider to be traditional nuclear families that I personally have encountered. But when I think about happy kids, I think about kids who call their dad sir. Those are the happiest boys I ever see. Are the ones who say yes sir. They're th by far, by far. And, and again, it, it, just, it just happened to be a Mormon family, but it was a deeply religious family in this few contacts that I make with those things. I, I remember this father had, I think he had nine, nine kids, and his little daughter came up to him and, and, and started talking. He said, Dad, Dad, let me show you something. He said, one second, sweetheart. I want you to, just one second, sweetheart. And I've been in that situation, mm -hmm. and that one second turns into four minutes, mm -hmm. and then, you know, Dad walks away. But after he'd finished talking to who he was talking to, he turned around, faced this girl, went down on his, you know, got down on his haunches like this, had her right in front of his face. He says, what? What is it, darling? What, what did you want to talk to him? I gave her, 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 gave her his full attention. And that family was the happiest kids I've, I've seen by far. And I'm only saying that to say that as a person who didn't have a strong family in that regard, I still put my family ahead of everything else, but when I look at, at, at those people, the actual life on Earth, so, right, in terms of the actual hours spent here on planet Earth, those families spend more time talking about religion than any other family that I've ever run into, and they do it in a family setting because that's what they do. And, and I don't see how you can get to that level of familiarity with with the high concepts of of morality and justice and and forgiveness and grace without 
having a place where young children can sit comfortably and 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 enthusiastically and learn these things. Oh, I hear you, man. And I I, I um I don't think I've said anything different. The only thing I I, I would would contest is the premium of it. So if, if we're saying that this starts with the family, I agree with you in terms of uh, the tangible aspect of it, but that family still has to be built on something. There has to be something to build to keep to keep it together. And every family has their own ideas of what keeps them together. But there is something that is fixed and eternal to be built to build that family on. We can have our own ideas, but as the word says, these things will be built on sand. If you want to have the solidarity with that family that goes into perpetuity, it needs to be built on something fixed and eternal. Your family, as we've said, your family does not have to be your blood. Your family can just simply be people who are on your frequency. You know, and you can find your family if you were like an orphan or a fa- or feral, feral kid, as you had mentioned, you know, and, and you go into these different, hey man, sometimes people find their family on the streets. It could be their gangs, you know, and things like that. You see what I'm saying? That's why family itself, your family is your gang and it's your family to do bad things with. So that's why I'm saying the family isn't necessarily the, the thing to look to. It may be the conduit. And I agree with you, the conduit by, by which a person may learn these virtues. The Lord himself isn't just a writ of instruction. He is the instruction. Uh, you know, these things that are that are wired into you, I, I kind of wanted to, to come back to uh, what you had mentioned about uh, even with Adam and Eve. Adam dropped the ball. And 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 he was built to represent God in nature. But the reason why Adam can now die and the rest of us can is because Adam stopped reflecting who God is. Not only did he didn't he didn't transgress against God to protect Eve. Matter of fact, once he ate from the fruit and God called him out on it, Adam blamed Eve. He didn't do he didn't say I did this to protect Eve. He's like this woman that you gave me. He blamed Eve. He blamed God. He blamed everybody except the devil who influenced them to do it. Hmm. And that's where we're at right now. We watch people blaming all the wrong people. Typical man. Typical man, right? And and but still, just like it's you still said. It's still shameful though. It's shameful behavior. Yes, it is. But just as you have said, you've said it right. We have that we, we're supposed to be productive. We're supposed to be fruitful. The Lord's and following this, the Lord said, hey. I need you to be fruitful and multiply. Being fruitful and multiply doesn't mean going out and making a bunch of families, right? Be fruitful and multiply means that, look, I need you to be fruitful. I need you to be productive, then reproductive, all right? I need you to be fruitful. I need you to be self-sustaining. I need you to be self-sufficient. I need you to not only be that, I need you to be fruitful in the way that you conduct yourself. And then multiply and pass those virtues in action, maybe not in writs, maybe not in speech, in a way that they can't understand it. You got to demonstrate, just like you talk about, you know, man got down, you know, looked this kid right in the eye. What's up, baby? How, you know, what, what can daddy do for you? You know what I'm saying? This is this is ministering to your kids in a way that they can understand. You know, in a, in a they don't have to read it. It's not, it's not a bunch of complex legalism concerning religion. You eye to eye face to face with him, just like Moses and God. Moses says, the word says that God spoke to Moses face to face as one does with a friend, you know? So it's like, that's where we want to be. You got to demonstrate this kind of stuff. Well, we may be dealing with a semantics issue then, Mm -hmm. because when I say the family is first, I don't mean the family is the most important thing. I mean, it comes first. You can't have any of the other things without that thing there first. Mm -hmm. Um, And certainly, the greatest obstacle to state control is the biological, generally speaking, biological, or at the very least, extraordinarily intimate relationship between people in a family, which is why I think, the, I don't think, it's no question about it, the destruction of the family is the ultimate goal of, of any state, of any state that's determined to have power over human lives, you have to destroy the family first, uh, uh-huh. because the, the children have to be children of the state. Because of the biological, when I say the biological connection, let me just be crystal clear about this, okay? I'm talking about if you adopt a child at birth, right? He's an adopted child. You've got three natural kids and a fourth adopted kid. Those four kids are, I'm going to refer to them as your biological family because you live with them every day. You grew up with them. The, the, The father and the mother and the brothers and sisters are part of that child's life for the, for the rest of its life. That, that connection, that, that, that bond is so powerful. It's like an atomic. It's like a molecular bond. You know, mm. it's it's like it's like a, a it's like the the magnetic force. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the the attractive forces that hold molecules together okay. is so powerful that it has to be split 
before you can really truly own a generation for the needs of the state. It, it, it's the number one obstacle, hmm. especially, in fact, look, I'll go further. The, the traditional man and woman monogamous nuclear family is the, is the molecule that has to be split for the state to succeed. If your family structure consists of a of a clan and you've got and your dad is a you know is a is a, a warlord or a merchant or something and he's got 19 wives and and you've got 600 brothers and 600 sisters right then then the family bonds don't work then it's just a question of i i, I need to somehow take this guy's position because he's ahead of me he's not my brother not in the sense that we understand the term this this monogamous nuclear family as we understand it is a relatively new invention in terms of humans. It has been astonishingly successful. It's responsible for all of the success that has pulled all of us out of being, you know, living in, in, um, li living in, in mud thatched, you know, buildings with, with dirt floors has gotten us there because of the, the power and the discipline and mostly, mostly the power of instruction and the power of example set between a husband and a wife and a strong father and a loving mother and all the rest of it. It's, it's the, it is the optimum arrangement mm -hmm. for the creation of moral, good children. And, and that's why I thought it was the thing that had to be addressed first in our society, mm -hmm. because it is where the unraveling is certainly the most evident. This idea, just look, just the fact that you have a term called baby daddy, right? <laughs> I'm serious, right? Who, who's this guy? Is, is, is he the child's father? Well, he's the baby daddy. That, that's, that's actually, if you think about it, if a woman says that, she's actually making a, a rather precise moral evaluation, right? Is this the kid's father? No, it's the boy's baby daddy. What, she's actually aware of the fact that this person was just basically a biological element. He's not the father of that child, right. right? That child may not have a father, or maybe the mother is doing her best to become the father, but that child doesn't have a father. He's got a baby daddy. He has a progenitor, hmm. right? And and when you get into a society where, where all these bonds are essentially not there present at birth, then you got a real problem, and and you have a real problem when you have a, a child born into what looks like a, a traditional family. There's a mom and a dad, maybe there's a brother, but if divorce becomes so prevalent and so easy and so common, and furthermore, it's not even a question of the fact that the divorce is traumatic to the children. The thing that's traumatic to the children is all the yelling and screaming that goes on prior to the divorce, mm. right? That's what does the damage. That's what does the damage, is hearing these two people, and I'm speaking from experience, you're hearing these two people yelling at each other for 10 years, you know, you, you love them both, you hear them both destroying each other on the other side of the door there. Where are you gonna, where are you gonna, where are you gonna gain any guidance? Where are you gonna gain any confidence? Where are you gonna gain any security? It doesn't exist. And so when you make divorce easier, what you're basically, look, I'm not saying, that 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 life on the farm and that, that idealized American uh, family didn't have problems. But if you lived in a society where divorce was next to impossible, then arguing and yelling and screaming didn't really accomplish much. You know, you had a choice. You, look, this we're here together and that's it. So we're either going to find a way to make this work on some level or we're not. But in any event, I just look out there and when I see the hatred, the hatred that these uh, that these young progressive women have for for babies this 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 ce celebration of abortion this 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 worship of it right the hatred that they have for 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 life for for children I always want to ask these we did that show on those two women that we're talking about mm. televising right and the first thing I want to ask those two uh, creatures is tell me about your tell me about your dad start with your dad and then I want to hear about your mom mm. and you already know what the answer is going to be mm. right you can't get to a level of self-hatred if you are if you are consistently loved by people when you're a child you can't get there and and conversely if you don't have that it's almost impossible for you not to end up there indeed man and that's you know when we have the uh, you know we got the narrative out there you know and a lot of this narrative is le led by left-wingers the destroyers of the family and and you know 
just like you know, when we talk about a nuclear family, you're gonna and you're gonna split that thing. It's gonna do a lot of damage, you know. And uh, but you know, liberals wanting to remove the man from the house, while at the same time they want to be the champions of the narrative of don't forget to be a father today, right? And as I've said before, and and and, and a lot of people get caught up in the narrative of, of the importance of fathers. The, the, the importance in the premium on fathers and fatherhood is not the issue. Husbands, be a husband before you are a father. The first yeah, thing you've made this point, before. right? It's a good point. That's where it counts. Now, the, the term husband, we, we when we talk about husbandry, you had said it earlier. You know, you've got to tend your garden. Well, that's what husbandry, that's what a, a husband is. A husband is somebody who that's where we get the word from. It's tending mm-hmm. to your garden. Right. You got to be attentive to your wife. You got to be attentive. And then from there, you got to be, man, I'm telling you, one of of the most the language that dooms a marriage. Right. See it play over and over again. It's like one of the reasons why I'm careful. I'm very careful about, like I said, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just careful about the premium that I put on family. One of the most dooming languages that that, uh, a family can speak over their over their family is that my children are the most important thing to me in the world. Right. So let me get this straight. Your kids matter to you more than the person that you created them with. Your kids matter to you more than the one who blessed you to be able to have them. You have spoken idolatry over your children. And we see, and we see these parents today is coming more and more. They're making idols out of their kids. They're trying to shape their kids into what they want them to be. Even if it's a boy and they're going to idolize that kid and shape that boy into becoming a girl. Right. This is what happens when people put this premium on their children and they say that these are the most important things in my life to me. No, the person that you created them with. That's what your kids need to see. That's that security that we're talking about. See, a lot of kids don't see that. Yeah. Just like you said, you know, before the divorce comes, there's all the arguing. And this, that's what really traumatizes the kid is all the arguing. Their parents don't get along and they talk to each other like dogs. Right. They have no respect Matter of fact, a lot of times they talk to their pets nicer than they talk to each other. Oh, yeah. Right. So we see this is what these kids are grown up with. They grow up with that. And we see it today how kids are just they come from broken homes. They're totally insecure. They're wrapped up with pride and they don't know how to express their pride, except for to assume that they could be three or four different genders. They're all over the place. Right. So this is what happens, you know, when people assume that they can go ahead and teach these virtues on their own accord. That's why the word says, do not lean on your own understanding. Trust in God. Dang it, it's our national motto. In God we trust, but we don't seem to trust him. No, we don't. And, um, you know, I named my first blog Eject, Eject, Eject because I had so many ideas that I passionately believed in that I was completely wrong about. Uh, And I was lucky enough to, and maybe just curious enough to have thought about these things deeply and come to some different conclusions. But one of the reasons why I was so uh, far off the mark for for my teenage years and into my 20s was because of that lack of security. And it's a funny thing. I spent much of my childhood just terrified of the idea of my parents getting divorced. You know, it was like the worst possible thing I could imagine. And I remember with crystal clarity, I mean, I can. I remember exactly where I was sitting in my bedroom and all the rest of it. I remember when my dad finally left, and I thought this is the worst thing that could happen. And the thing that struck me the most was how peaceful things were. Huh. You know, it's like this is the first night ever where I'm not hearing all this yelling and screaming. You know, it was a relief. And if you get to the point where, if you get to the point where, the values that hold a family together are so disrupted that a kid feels relief when one of his two parents leaves because there's no mm-hmm. longer this endless sounds of, you know, battle and artillery fire out there. <laughs> right. You you just, you're, that was my clear thought was, you know, my God, it's so quiet. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't have to, I don't have to, I don't have to pretend I'm not hearing this stuff, mm-hmm. you know, um, but it does its damage. And so anyway, the great thing about the show is the ability to just kick ideas around and, 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 and this is a valuable discussion to have. It's just yet another case where you and I disagree on things. I'm right. You're wrong. There's nothing we can do about that. That's just the way things go. You know, 
All right. Uh, but still, we can agree that it's in the top five. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe we'll continue this. We'll talk about things like honor and commitment and marriage and all the rest of it. But in any event, some kind of theme to get us uh, into some new territories, perhaps. So uh, that'll do it for this edition of The Virtue Signal, which is made possible by the by our little family here uh, at BillWhittle.com and people who, um, who pay for this content. Not only pay for this content, but pay for this content to go to people who don't pay for this content. It's really quite a remarkable thing when you think about it. Uh, so thanks again to those people from, from both of us. And uh, for my friend Alfonso Rachel, I'm Bill Whittle. We'll see you next time right here on The Virtue Signal.